So hello, in this class, we're gonna be talking about the renal diet and what should my patient eat. And we're talking about the dialysis patient. In dialysis, people that are in dialysis have a real challenge in terms of choosing what they can eat and what they should avoid. I always say, we shouldn't say, do not eat this, do not eat that. We always tell the patient, these things are high, for example, in potassium, and you should avoid them. If you are going to have any of those type of foods, just do a minimum amount and just once a week. So I tend to tell that um, the patients that so that they don't feel that they are not allowed to do something because you and I know that when a person is not allowed to do something, most of the time they would like they will try to do whatever it is that they're not allowed to. So let's go ahead and start. Again, this presentation is called The Renal Diet, What Should My Patient Eat? And this is what we're going to be covering for today. We're going to be talking about the dialysis patient, um, a little bit on the modalities, nutrition for hemodialysis patients. We're going to talk about the waste and fluid buildup, and we're going to go over water, protein, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and vitamins. So all of these topics were included in the nutrition presentation that all students had here in the classroom but this is going to be like a summary where we're going to pick up all of the topics and put them together for a better understanding so the goal is to provide guidance to dialysis and non-dialysis personnel in educating a renal failure patient on dialysis about the renal diet and what they can eat so again, we know that dialysis, a dialysis patient is the person that receives dialysis and they receive dialysis because they have renal failure. The, there are five stages for chronic kidney disease and the treatment for chronic kidney disease includes dialysis, medication, and diet. And diet is the one that we're gonna be focusing today. In dialysis modalities, we have different modalities. We have in-center hemodialysis, nocturnal in-center hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and home hemodialysis. But of course, the focus of this course is in-center hemodialysis. In in-center hemodialysis, the, this is the most common type of hemodialysis offered. It's done in an outpatient center the patient comes to the clinic three times a week and the treatments can be between three to five hours long. The staff members perform the treatment and there are self-care options available for patients that wish to. They can choose to um, do something, for, do one of the part of the treatments, be it setting up the machine or sticking themselves or cleaning their chair anything that will give them a little bit of empowerment and control over their illness. So when we talk about the nutrition for in-center hemodialysis, we have to understand that this nutrition could be different than the nutrition or the diet that is suggested for the other modalities. So we need to understand this first. Remember that the healthy kidneys work 24 seven. They are going to remove the waste from the blood. And when we say waste, I want you to understand that the waste for us is going to be all of the minerals, all of the vitamins, all of the elements that are in excess. That if it wasn't in excess, it, it wouldn't uh, make any harm to the patient. For example, People that don't have any problems with the kidneys need potassium, need sodium. Now, people that have chronic kidney failure, they have problems eating, uh, eating foods that are high in potassium or high in sodium because there's going to be a buildup because their kidneys cannot filter those um, nutrients. And that is when whatever the excess built up in the body, that is the waste. That is what we call the waste. So what does waste mean? 
it is a buildup of chemicals, minerals, elements, vitamins, and toxins mainly acquired through our diet. So what can build up? It, urea can build up, and urea is a waste too. Many people tend to use the term urine and blood to explain what urea is. Creatinine is the waste from the muscle. So every time your muscles move, so if I do like this, I just create a creatinine. So every time your muscles move, you create creatinine. Uh, another thing is potassium, sodium, phosphorus, and fluids. So when any of these are in excess, that is called waste. So the renal diet for an in-center hemodialysis patient needs to give them good nutrition, but at the same time limit the buildup of waste between treatments. Patients on peritoneal dialysis, home hemodialysis, or, noctur or nocturnal in-center hemodialysis have a more flexible diet. Diet can be adjusted per patient, and the level of protein, calories, fluid, minerals, and vitamins can change based on the need of each patient. The diet helps them feel better between treatments, okay? So we also have to understand that no two patients are the same. Patients' uh, needs will vary because we might have a patient that doesn't have any problem with potassium, but here we probably have a patient that have a problem with hyperkalemia, which would be high potassium. So this is an example of potassium. In this case, remember that our range for potassium is between 3.5 to 5.5, uh, I'm sorry, milli equivalent in liter. So this is a week. What you see in, on, on the screen is a week that goes from Sunday to Saturday. And let's imagine this patient's treatments are from Monday, are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So let's look at Sunday first. Sunday, you can see how the potassium slowly builds up until Monday morning. Monday mornings are gonna be the most dangerous days for the patients that come to treatment Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday, because it's when the potassium is going to be in its highest level inside of the patient's body. And we know that potassium is something that we, we have to be aware of and we have to monitor closely because potassium can give symptoms to your patients from one minute to another. The patient can have arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, you name it. Potassium is going to affect the muscles directly. I'm sorry. And w the most important muscle that the potassium is going to affect is the heart. So Monday in that treatment, the potassium is going to drop and you can see it right there on the Monday, the, how the potassium drops. Then it starts building up again and again and again and again, Tuesday until Wednesday, it's high again. On Wednesday, we dialyze, the potassium drops, and the next day, it starts building up again, 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 until Friday. Friday, the potassium drops, and then we have two days off, which again, makes it Monday the most dangerous day, okay? So again, hyperkalemia is too much potassium in blood, and this can cause change in the heart rhythm, weak muscles, belly cramps, skip heartbeats, or heart may stop. So the in-center hemodialysis diet is based on, the diff on these different groups. They can eat proteins and that's gonna be in the protein is gonna be included the beef, the pork, the chicken, the eggs, the fish, the cheese, peanut butter, tofu, and vegetarian meats. And in a minute, I'm going to explain about these um, different groups. Dairy, milk, ice cream, yogurt, pudding, bread and starches, vegetables and fruit, fats like butter and oils, calorie boosters like hard candy or jelly beans, and others like spices and condiments. So let's start talk about the protein first. All food have some type of protein. The two main types of protein are the high biological value and the low bi biological value. 
the high biological value comes from animal or from soy protein and some of the examples are meat, fish, poultry, eggs, tofu, soy milk, and dairy products. And then the low biological bo value comes from other plant protein and some of the examples are bread, grains, vegetables, dry beans, peas, and fruits. Now for our dialysis patients, it is suggested that they take the high biological value protein, that they eat the high biological value protein. So the protein helps maintain body, body muscle and tissue. Dialysis patients need at least 50% more protein each day than healthy people. So people that have no problem with the protein, uh, I'm sorry, with the kidneys, they will they will eat whatever is the uh, allowed the suggested amount allowed in a daily basis and we're going to talk about that in a minute but the dialysis patient should double that should double that because dialysis patient lose prote protein at each treatment okay and the way that the protein is lost during dialysis is not that the protein goes through the filter it's more that the protein attaches to the fibers inside of the filters. So the protein will create blood urea nitrogen or BUN and creatinine. So the more protein they eat, the more BUN or blood urea nitrogen and creatinine they're going to they're going to have in their system. So healthy kidneys can remove BUN and creatinine, creatinine, but failed kidneys cannot, okay? So the protein in dialysis, dialysis can decrease the BUN and the and the creatinine. There are some tests done at the dialysis clinic and these are going to be the BUN and the creatinine again. So if the BUN is high, that means that we're probably this patient is having poor dialysis probably or that the patient is eating too much waste if the patient has low BUN means that there there could be a good dialysis or the patient may have poor muscle mass and high creatinine means that there is an inadequate dialysis low creatinine means that there could be a good dialysis or that the patient may have lost muscle mass. So an example um, about this so that you can understand it better. If you compare an old lady, an 80 year old lady with a younger man, a 40 year old man, the older lady may have less creatinine even though probably both of them are on dialysis, but the older lady is going to have a lower creatinine than the younger man, a 40 year old man, because the older la lady has less muscle mass and is probably less active than the other. So the protein helps increase the albumin and albumin helps the body heal and fight uh, diseases. So if the albumin is low, the morbidity is higher and the chances that this person or patient can die um, are higher okay since dialysis patients need more protein than healthy people it is recommended that they eat high biological value protein and i had said that before so here is this table let's just go over it real quick and here we have diff different ages but i want us to concentrate on the two rows on the last two rows women's ages 19 through 70 plus and then men's ages 19 70 plus so these are the dietary allowance for protein recommended by the cdc the centers of disease control here in the united states so for women ages 19 to 70 plus the grams of protein recommended are 46 grams and for men 19 to 70 plus the allowed uh, or the yeah the allowed amount of protein recommended should be 56 grams for a dialysis patient you want to go ahead and double that because they lose 
protein throughout their treatment. Now here are some examples of what does, does that amount, the amount of, of, of protein represent. For example, here we can, we can see it better. Uh, chicken breath, chicken breath of about 3.5 ounces. It could be like the palm of our hand. It's 30 grams of protein. And let me go back for a minute. If we go by this um, table, if we go back to the women, the allowed amount recommended is 46 grams. If we eat one chicken breath, 3.5 ounces, which is a fairly small, it's not that big of a chicken breath, there we have 30, more than 50% of our allowed amount recommended, right? So this is an eye opener because with this, you can see how much protein we really eat during the day. So a tuna, a tuna can, and this is like a six ounce can, that's about 40 grams of protein if you eat it all. Egg, and we're talking about a large egg, is about six grams of protein. Milk, one cup, about eight grams. Tofu, half a cup, 20 grams of protein. Soy milk, one cap, six to 10 grams, one cup, six to 10 grams, and then peanut butter, two tablespoons, eight grams. In terms of calories, the dialysis patients need calorie. They need calorie for energy. If they don't, they will become malnourished. And malnourished is when the body burns the protein for fuel. That means they will burn their own muscles. No protein left for other body functions. And that is dangerous. So when patients are uremic or that the buildup, the, the waste buildup is really, really high, they lose their appetite because things are not tasting well. They're not smelling well. So who wants to eat if you can't smell things well or they're not tasting well, right? There is something that most of the patients say that is typical. And what they say is that the food tastes strange and it has like a metallic taste. They can have, they can present nausea and vomit. Um, new patients tend to have more of these issues and patients that starts to lose weight. So we got to keep an eye on those new patients. New patients, they tend to, um, to stop eating because things are not smelling or tasting the same. So we want to keep an eye on those patients and ask them, are you eating well? What have you, what did you eat yesterday? What did you eat during the weekend? Stuff like that so that we can identify if this patient is losing appetite or not. And then we can refer this patient to um, the dietitian. And if the patient needs um, the means to buy the food, then to the social worker. So when we talk about weight, we want to talk about, we want to focus on real weight. It is often confused with fluid removal, okay? So signs of real weight loss is that the patient, the fluid buildup is going to be in the ankles and in the fingers. The patient is gonna be short of breath and the patient is not gonna be able to lay flat in bed. So you gotta ask the patient, can you lay flat in bed? And if they say no, we know that there is a fluid buildup. <clears throat> so, how can we help the patients? We're gonna let the dietitian know if the patient mentions he's not eating well. We're gonna let the social worker know um, so that they can also help patients to receive the meals. You're, we're gonna let the nurse know if patients gain a lot of fluid between dialysis, and then the nurse will report this to the doctor and a care plan meeting will be scheduled to plan how are we gonna um, manage this patient. Most of the time we start with a lot of education, fluid management education first, and then also letting them know about the importance of completing their treatments and coming to their treatments when they are supposed to come. Because when they're cleaner, it's going to be best for them because they're going to be able to smell better and taste the food better. So malnutrition is a high risk of death. The, it can be treated, that's the good thing. The patient, we can try to get the patient to eat 
a little more. So that would be step one. So if we have a patient that is malnourished, we're gonna try to get this patient to eat more. If that doesn't work, then we are going to recommend protein drinks, powders, or bars that could be used by the dialysis patient. And these are gonna be um, these products that are for the dialysis patient. For example, there is one uh, protein shake that is called Nepro. So if it's a dialysis patient, they shouldn't be taking Ensure or Glucerna, those type of things. They should be taking the protein shake that is made for them because the, the rest of the protein shakes may have different nutrients that we don't want to give the patients like magnesium, potassium, etc. So if that doesn't work, then the doctors start talking about a feeding tube to the stomach. Um, if that is not working either, then we move on to the IDPN, which is the intradialytic parenteral nutrition. And this is nutrition that we will give to the patient through their veins during dialysis. And this nutri nutrition includes carbohydrates, protein, fat, sugars, and amino acids. TPN would be like the last resource because TPN means total parenteral nutrition. In this case is that this patient is receiving most of their nutrition through their veins during dialysis and outside of the of dialysis so now let's talk about the water so the kidneys two main functions are to remove the waste and the excess fluid so there are two things that we do when the patient comes to dialysis we remove that waste and we also clean them so it's not true when a patient tells you well i didn't gain a lot of fluid so i'm not going to dialysis because i don't need dialysis that is not true they still need dialysis because we need to clean them okay so um dialysis also uh, i'm sorry the kidneys also have other functions they also create hormones they create an acid and base balance, and they also control the blood pressure. So dialysis patients do not urinate or produce very little. So you're gonna have patients that still create a little bit of urine and others that don't create any at all. So the fluid builds up in the body. Fluid should be rem removed during dialysis. Fluid is limited to a liter per day in most cases. Fluid is not only water, it could be foods that are liquid and room temperature like jello, ice cream, and popsicles. All those are counted as fluid too. Soups, coffee, all that. Okay? So anyways, let's go back to the limited amount of fluid that they have. Here it says one liter and one liter is 32 ounces so when you present this to the patient i like to tell them i don't like to tell them a single number i don't like to tell them one liter i like to tell them well you can drink four eight ounces cups for example that will give us 32 ounces or i i want to tell them i want them to perceive that they can drink a lot okay so I like to tell them, okay, so listen, you can do two eight ounces cups and then four four ounces cups, okay? And that also gives me the 32 ounces. If I want them to still see more, I would tell them, okay, this is what you're going to do. You can do four four ounces cups and eight two ounces cu cups and that kind of gives them the perception of okay so I can drink many of these cups throughout my day okay so the dry weight is established for each patient the amount of fluid to remove during dialysis is established at the beginning and that would be the the pre-weight so the patient is going to walk in we're going to weigh the patient and then we're going to subtract the dry weight from that pre-weight too much fluid causes edema high blood pressure shortness of breath more fluid buildup 
will give potential complications during treatment. And these complications could be hypotension, cramps, dizziness, passing out or throwing up, and feeling washed out after treatment. So let me step back for a minute so that you understand this. The fluid buildup will cause hypertension before dialysis. But during dialysis, when we start dialysis, because we are going to be removing a lot of fluid, then it could cause hypotension, okay? And cramps and dizziness and passing out and all that. But I just wanted to point out the difference between when the patient is going to have the hypertension and when the patient may have the hypotension. Okay, so most serious complica complications about fluid buildup can be myocardial stunning, which is when the heart can't beat as strongly, and then the LVH, which is the left ventricular hypertrophy, which is an enlargement of the left ventricle of the heart, leading cause of death in the hemodialysis patient. So fluid management will be advised and treatment modality change can also help. So if we have a patient in in-center dialysis and they cannot seem to manage their fluid after multiple education and all that, then we probably have to suggest this patient to do another modality. Like probably that's something that is more frequent. More frequent dialysis will help this type of patient. Sodium. Sodium, the major part is the major part of the table salt. Half teaspoon of, teaspoon of salt contains one gram or a thousand milligrams of sodium. And this is crazy because a half a teaspoon, try to find in your house half a teaspoon. That is nothing, but it contains a large amount of sodium. So all foods contain sodium it can it 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 can't all t be taken out of the diet. Hemodialysis patients should not use table salt, salt or their substitutes. Okay, best if salty food are avoided altogether. So, when a dialysis patient is telling you, if they tell you, I'm using a salt substitute you have to say no you cannot use that salt substitute because the salt substitutes normally are done with potassium so that means that they're sprinkling potassium every time they eat and we already know how dangerous potassium can be so sodium can also um they could also have these symptoms thirst high blood pressure and weight gain sodium in the blood attracts water and that will make them swell up have edema Failed kidneys are unable to remove the sodium, and patients should avoid sodium if they already have the swelling or the edema in the hands, uh, face, hands, or feet, if they already have high blood pressure, and if they gain weight quickly because uh, due to fluid buildup. So with the sodium, less sodium is going to make them less thirsty. And if they are less thirsty, they're not going to drink as much fluid. If they have more sodium in their body, they are going to be drinking many, much more fluid. So the U.S. guidelines suggest that we take 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. Even if we do not salt, we find sodium in other foods like canned foods, packed helper foods, pickled foods, Preserved meats such as cold cuts like hams, turkey, ham, sausages, and hot dogs. Patients should try no salt herbs and spices like basil, lemon, pepper, and Mrs. Dash. So there are some myths that the American Heart Association has, and um, I will I will include this the PDF the PDF of this presentation is going to be below this video. Um, and you can check it out. Check out the PDF of this presentation so that you can read the seven salty myth busted by the American Heart Association. So now let's talk about potassium. In dialysis patient, the normal should be between 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalent. High potassium foods are, are high potassium foods, like examples of high potassium foods could be avocado, mangoes, bananas, oranges, dry fruits, 
melon, dry peas and beans, tomato sauce, potatoes, salt substitutes, espresso or cappuccino. So the patients, we should strongly advise the dialysis patients to avoid these types of, of foods. Chewing tobacco may increase the potassium as well. Orange juice is very high in potassium and potatoes is also high, a high source of potassium. So we do need potassium for the nerves, muscles, water balance, and the use of glucose, but too much would be hyperkalemia and it will cause change in the rhythm of the heart, weak muscles, belly cramps, skipped heartbeats, and the heart may stop. And if we have too, um, too little, like we don't have enough, hypokalemia can cause fatigue, weak muscles, change in the heart of the rhythm. And then this, the, the having it low is really rare in in-center dialysis patients, but we still have to be aware that it could happen. And mainly it could happen to these, to the patients that are vomiting or having diarrhea. They can lose, they can lose potassium through diarrhea or vomiting. So we have to keep an eye on the, on them. So the patient can eat, in, in order to avoid high uh, foods high in potassium, the patient can eat pa pasta or rice, drink apple or cranberry juice, um, read food labels, many water and uh, many energy waters, vitamins or mineral drinks have lots of potassium. And the meat can be injected with potassium for more shelf life. So we have to read the labels. We have to read the label to see if there's any potassium in that food that we are buying or the, at least the amount, because sometimes we are not going to be able to buy something that is totally free of potassium because it's used as a preservative, but we want to see the amounts. We want to see that it's low amounts. Okay, so potassium is checked every month at the clinic and with the results we're able to determine how much potassium intake the patient can have. And we also can determine what is the dialysate bath that we're using with that patient. So potassium can build up in the body the highest after two days off and that would be for a patient that is Monday, Wednesday and Friday that would be on the morning Monday and for a patient that is Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday that would be on the Tuesday morning. Okay so cajaxolate may be used to lower the potassium. Cajaxolate is a medication used for that and the food labeled low salt may have high potassium content. Calcium dialysis patients range from 8.4 to 9.9 .9 milligrams in deciliters and it shouldn't be higher than 10.2. The total intake for patients should be 2,000 milligrams per day. Failed kidneys cannot keep calcium and phosphorus in balance, therefore patients could have complications such as secondary hyperparathyroidism or mineral bone, mineral bone disorder. And the problem with these disorders is that this is something that is going to be that we're going to see it in the long run. This is not something that you will see it immediately. And the risk is that by the time that we identify it, it's because it has been building up for a long time. So it is very difficult to treat once we identify it. Phosphorus, in center dialysis, remove phosphorus, but not too much because the phosphorus cell is bigger than, for example, the, cal the calcium cells or the potassium cells. So the phosphorus cells is bigger and it takes a longer time to be able to remove it from the body. So the foods that the patient should limit are dairy, cola, beans, whole grains, and nuts. Limit of 800 to 1000 milligrams a day of phosphorus. Phosphorus is in most foods because it's the number one preservative, flavor enhancer, and additive used in the United States. And the level should stay between 3.5 and 5.5. Hyperphosphatemia is too much phosphorus and it's linked to MBD or mineral bone disease and higher risk of death. MBD symptoms could, could, could be itching, bone and joint pain, muscle weakness, and bone fractures. 
Patients may not feel anything until bone damage has occurred. Phosphorus and calcium bond together and they cause crystal-like deposit that can cause hardening of the arteries and veins. So when calcium and phosphorus meet, this is it's almost like love at first sight, okay? And they bond together and then it's very difficult or almost impossible to separate them again. And the thing is that their cells are not rounded they create the the they create like a crystal cell and they have like a shape form okay so that's why they deposit they can try to come out through the pores and that's why the patients are itching too much very much um they can deposit in the organs they can damage the veins i had a patient years ago that when a patient years ago that when he went to his transplant he was called for a transplant they opened him and when they what they saw was that the the artery and the vein going to the kidneys and those were the same artery and veins that they were going to use for the new kidneys they were calcified okay so the patients need to know this information we need to educate the pa the patients because when we see the symptoms when we see all this it's it's probably a little too late so since removal of phosphorus from the food is difficult, patients are ordered phosphate binders. They come in form of pills, powder, or liquid. They are taken with foods and they bond with phosphorus. And then the phosphorus is excreted in the stool. If they get constipation, a stool softener will be ordered and modalities like nocturnal dialysis help with phosphorus control. Now, very important, and this is something that I always like to mention. When the patient is on a phosphorus binder, they have to take this medication with their food. It's not in the morning or at night, it's with their food. So the proper way to take it is at least, or not more than half an hour before they eat, or they can take it in the middle of their meal, okay? or they can take it a maximum of 30 minutes be, uh, after their meal. So let me go back and say that again. 30 minutes before their meal, they can take it in the middle of their meal or 30 minutes after their meal. It has to be while the food is still in the stomach. If the food is not in the stomach or the food passes the stomach, this is not gonna work. So how the, the, the foods that are very, very high in phosphorus are the following. Milk, ice cream, yogurt, or pudding. And we have to become investigators. These are uh, questions that we can ask the patients. Have you had or have you been eating this? Milk, ice cream, yogurt, or pudding. Cheese or peanut butter. Cheese flavor crackers or snack foods. Liver, organ meats, hot dogs, sausages, or enhanced meat. Canned salmon with bones or sardines. Nuts or seeds, almonds, pecans, sunflowers, or pumpkin seeds. Dry beans and peas or baked beans, including canned beans and peas. Quick breads, biscuits, cornbread, pancakes, or waffles made from mixes brand muffins, br brand cereals or granola bars, pizza lasagna, tacos, corn tortilla or fast foods, chocolate caramels or candies containing chocolate, nuts or caramels, colas, canned tea, beer, cocoa or other drinks containing phosphate ad additives, foods or drinks with hitting stars of phosphorus like because not all the time the phosphorus is going to be uh, clear in the label they could come with these different names so these are different types of phosphorus additives phosphate polyphosphate pyrophosphate phosphoric acid and phytate so these are some suggestions instead of milk they can have non-dairy cre creamers rice milk and it should be the unenriched rice milk Instead of cheese, they can have cream cheese or sour cream. Instead of cola, they can have lemon lime soda. Some brands have root beer, root beer, I'm sorry, 
and lemonade and tea and also ginger ale they can have instead of chocolate candy they can have jelly beans or hard candy always aware of the patient that some of these foods still count as fluids and diabetic and diabetic patients should also follow diabetic diet now let's talk about the vitamins and in terms of vitamins we have water soluble vitamins and we have fat soluble vitamins the most important to know about is uh, for the dialysis patient is the water soluble vitamins because those are the ones that they lose mostly in that case we're talking about biotin folacin vitamin b6 b12 and c niacin thiamine riboflavin b2 patients should take 60 to 100 milligrams of vitamin c 1 to 5 milligram of folate, 2 milligrams of vitamin B6, and 3 micrograms of vitamin B12. Patients are ordered special vitamins, and they, these can come with the name of Renovite or Nephrobite. Dialysis patients cannot take vitam over-the-counter vitamins, so they should have their special vitamins ordered. So, in conclusion, the renal diet is a very limited diet. Patients should be approached with empathy when educated about what they can or cannot eat. As a health caregiver, you can help the dialysis patient determine what they can eat in order to feel better. Remember that we are all part of a team and it is our responsibility as a team to educate our patients. When we educate our patients, we help improve their quality of life. So I hope this helps you understand better the renal diet for dialysis patients. And remember that this is focused on the in-center dialysis question, um, patient. So if you have any questions, please send them to info at utopiahcc.com. And there is no quiz for this topic because w the quiz is going to be substituted with the presentation that you guys already did in class. So um, I hope you liked it and see you soon.